Through all the history of God's redemptive work in the world, civil rulers have worked against God's people, have sought to overrule God, to abuse their sphere of power by stepping into the world of God's kingdom and trying to take authority. Pharaoh abused his authority over Israel, and he was drowned. Saul overstepped the limits of his God-given sphere and lost his throne. Solomon corrupted his reign with gross immorality and destroyed the kingdom. Subsequently, all the kings of the north, Israel, were evil, and there were nineteen of them in a row that came under the judgment of God. Nebuchadnezzar exalted himself above God and became a madman. The Apostle Paul often disobeyed rulers who wanted him to deny the Lord Jesus Christ and stop preaching, and he refused to do that. And he was beaten with sticks and with whips, stoned, run out of town, put in jail, and eventually the Romans decapitated him for disobeying them to obey his God. In the book of Acts, and I want you to look at this for a moment, the apostles after the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord went about preaching boldly. The rulers of Jerusalem had told them to stop preaching. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they brought them, they stood them before the council, the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Here it is. Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Get that? We must obey God rather than men. Does this mean we have no responsibility to our leaders? Not at all. God has ordained human government for the peace and well-being of temporal society. We render to Caesar what is Caesar's. When orders come, however, to us that contradict the orders of our King, we have to obey God rather than men. One argument continues to be made, why didn't you do this at the beginning? Number one, we didn't know the extent of the disease, the illness. We were told millions were going to die. It was just sensible and rational to be protective. As time went on, however, we found out the virus was not as deadly as predicted. And the commands not to assemble didn't apply to protesters and riots. And little by little, Sunday by Sunday, you kept coming back. We didn't send out an order. You just kept showing up. Why did you come back? You came back because your heart cries out to be here. This is where you live and move and have your being. You came because you're not afraid, because 
God takes care of all of us. The unanimous will of the people has expressed itself. Why not sooner? Predictions of death. Why now? Aren't we putting people in danger? The real danger in this world is spiritual, isn't it? But let's talk about that danger from the virus. Twenty-seven states have a higher death rate than California. Twenty-seven states. California has had 8,300, about 8,300 persons die, and I just got this information from the state sources yesterday. 8,300 persons have died with COVID, not necessarily from it, but with it. At least that's what we're told. And for California, the California statistic is that's 21 people out of every 100,000. That means the death rate is 0.02. people percent of people will not die from this. But there's another statistic. Half of those people who died are over 80. So if you're under 80, you have a 99.99% chance that you're going to live through this whole thing. That just does not equate to the response this society has had. Now, 270,000 people in California, about a quarter of a million, a little more than a quarter of a million die every year. 65,000 die of heart disease. 60,000 plus die of cancer. 16,000 die of stroke. 16,000 die of Alzheimer's. 14,000 die of respiratory illness. 10,000 die of diabetes. 5,000 die from liver illness. That's from last year. This year they're all going to be higher because the hospitals were shut down. Fourteen thousand people die every year from accidents. Five thousand people from suicide, and that's going higher this year as well. How could they close the hospitals when these people are in jeopardy? for something that can affect only 0.01 percent of the population. By the way, alcohol kills three million people a year, and all the liquor stores were open. But here's the real issue. You know what the great killer in California is? I'll tell you what it is. The most deadly force in this state is death by medical people who do abortions. And I, I will give you the statistics of this state, 364 abortions a day. About one in four pregnancies in California ends in abortion. So every infant conceived has a one in four chance of never getting out of the womb. Eighty-eight percent of those abortions are with women who are not married. California has more abortions than any state in the United States, taxpayer funded. Let me tell you something. Death by abortion outstrips every other kind of death. You could take all the cancer deaths and all the heart disease deaths, put them together, and they don't come to the killing of children in the womb. There's no moral high ground among leaders in this state. They've kept all the abortion clinics open. 
through all these months. They've been deemed, along with the liquor stores, essential. So babies could continue to be slaughtered. But churches can't meet. This is the reality of a corrupt world. When babies have a one in four chance in our state of not even getting out of the womb. And hopefully, I guess, they would wish that the ones who do get out are politically correct. The slaughter is staggering. 900,000 in this country in a year, almost a million babies. This is a direct assault on the creative work of God, isn't it? But God overrules that. And I believe, and I know you do, that He gathers those little ones into His arms. Kill people with alcohol, kill people with cigarettes, kill people with diseases because the hospitals don't function. Lock people up so that everybody's under stress and make sure churches can't meet where's the only place they could find hope and help. We will not bow to such bizarre standards. We'll follow our Lord and trust Him. Some positive things coming out of this. The church always refines its convictions under duress. This is not a problem to be feared. This is a triumphant hour for the church to be the church. Standing for the glory of our Lord is more important in this hour than I've ever known it in my life. For His glory, we will stand and meet and worship and preach the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen.